So, uh, welcome. Today we have uh, the third lecture in the series on uh, climate and ocean color. Um, so that's being given by Professor Heather Bowman. Um, and uh, so following her PhD from Dalhousie University, um, Professor Bowman uh, worked at uh, BIO, the Bedford Institute of Oceanography uh, in Dartmouth in Nova Scotia, uh, and also um, at the Universidad de Concepcion. Uh, before moving to Oxford University in, I believe, 2006. And since joining the Earth Sciences Department within that uh, University of Oxford, um, Professor Bowman's built a research group which investigates the diversity and physiology of marine phytoplankton over a range of marine eco ecosystems, um, from the poles to the tropics. Um, her research uses data collected from both ships and satellites uh, to understand the main environmental factors controlling phytoplankton biogeography, and marine photosynthesis on regional to global scales. Uh, in addition to leading exciting research, uh, Professor Bowman also lectures undergraduates, um, oversees a number of PhD students, uh, and is the vice president for St. John's College in Oxford, which has a lot on a plate. Um, and as such, I think we can consider ourselves very lucky uh, to have her give us this lecture uh, today. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the, the Q&A session uh, at the end. Uh, so with that, um, we will uh, start the lecture. Um, Today's lecture is on phytoplankton community structure and its relationship to ocean biogeochemical cycles. And this is a really weighty topic. Um, it will take uh, probably several lectures to really go through properly. But I just want to give you an overview about why we care about phytoplankton biodiversity. Um, why we're interested not only in the quantity of phytoplankton cells and their productivity, but also the quality of these cells. Different phytoplankton play different roles in biogeochemical cycles, as we will see. Um, and so the cycling of energy and elements in the ocean relies heavily on the types of phytoplankton, not just the amount of chlorophyll or biomass. So, the lecture outline is as follows. We'll start by talking about the rationale for why we want to separate phytoplankton into various functional groups. I'll then go through my top four phytoplankton groups that are often used in global biogeochemical models and uh, ecosystem models. We'll um, then discuss how we measure phytoplankton community structure in the field. There's a variety of different ways. Each has its strengths and its weaknesses, and we'll, we'll discuss those because no one method really captures the total uh, diversity and richness of, of phytoplankton communities. We'll talk about the remote detection of the phytoplankton groups by uh, optical techniques, and then talk about future opportunities and challenges. Um, we have a whole bunch of new ways of measuring phytoplankton community structure and linking this up with satellites, and we'll just go through a few of those and talk about some of the resources available. So this is one of my favorite figures. This is from Zoe Finkel's review paper in Journal of Plankton Research. And I believe TJ showed this a few weeks ago when he introduced the module. And it shows Prochlorococcus um, at the lower end of our, our size range of phytoplankton. It's half a micron in diameter. And we're going all the way up to uh, the colonial cyanobacterium trichodesmium, which its colonies are about a millimeter or so in length. So we have this tremendous uh, range of sizes. Um, it's massive, four orders of magnitude. And what Zoe did was she helpfully scaled this up um, to uh, objects we encounter in our, our daily lives. So if we were to scale up Prochlorococcus to the size of a fish, um, our trichodesmium colony would be about the size of a, a city, the, the city of Manhattan. So it's, it just shows the in tremendous uh, size range of phytoplankton, and therefore we wouldn't expect for them to have the same biogeochemical or ecological role. They'll be metabolically very different. Their genome size, is, of course, will be uh, dramatically different, and that really determines that they will do very different things in ecosystems. So, um, one of the ecosystem services that we're 
in particularly interested in with phytoplankton is their role in the biological carbon pump. This is a lovely figure from Penny Chisholm back, that she uh, put together back in 2000 that shows phytoplankton community structure in very simple terms, uh, just dividing them up into two populations, a large one and a small one. The large population uh, we can see uh, will sink uh, to the deep ocean. That organic carbon that sinks will be remineralized in the deep ocean and therefore trapped for long periods of time from decades to millennia, depending on what water mass it ends up in. And we have our smaller phytoplankton that tend not to sink very much because they're very tiny. Uh, we saw that Chlorococcus was on the order of half a micron or so. And the little tiny protists that eat them are also very tiny. So they won't form these, these larger fecal pellets. So a lot of that organic carbon is recycled, is remineralized, and doesn't sink. And so the, the carbon dioxide that these cells take up tends to go back out um, as uh, CO2. So there's a, there's a balance there. So we can see that the phytoplankton community structure really dictates the fate of the, the carbon that's being fixed by phytoplankton communities. Also, the type of phytoplankton really impacts um, the overall community structure of the entire food web. This is a nice um, uh, diagram showing uh, the communities in the Banguela upwelling system. If we have diatoms dominating a particular time of year, we'll have large colonoid copepods uh, grazing on these um, diatoms and We'll have a fishery that is um, dominated by anchovies, whereas other times of the year we'll have flagellates dominating. These will be grazed on by smaller zooplankton, and sardines will tend to, to dominate under those conditions. So we can see that we'll have alternative food chains that may be favored depending on the phytoplankton community structure. So both the fate of the primary production in terms of where the carbon goes, whether it's being uh, respired in the surface ocean or sinks, or whether the phytoplankton supports particular groups of uh, higher trophic levels, this is all dictated by phytoplankton community structure. So this is why we're really interested in knowing who's out there and what they're doing in terms of the phytoplankton. One of the ecologists who was really interested in, in phytoplankton community structure and its relationship to marine ecosystems was Sir Alistair Hardy. Sir Alistair Hardy um, was a professor at Oxford at one point. He also spent a lot of time at sea in the Southern Ocean. He particularly was interested in the waters off Antarctica, where we have very productive ecosystems with plankton um, basically being grazed on by uh, a very active whaling um, uh, um, uh, fishery. And so Sir Alistair Hardy was very interested in the relationship between plankton community structure and higher trophic levels, in particular uh, fisheries and, and, and whales. And when he was flying over the English Channel one day, he noticed that the color of the ocean was very different. That we had some parts of the, the water that was very green in color, some that was deep blue. And he speculated that this ocean color, these optical water types, as it were, uh, were likely representative of different phytoplankton communities and that these were likely supporting different marine ecosystems. And he speculated that if there was some way we can interpret this ocean color signal, we might be able to find out something about um, the fisheries that are supported by this primary producers that um, impart that optical signal. And indeed, when we uh, look at the waters off uh, Plymouth and in the English Channel, we can see very different um, optical water types. This is an example of a coccolithophore bloom that routinely happens off uh, the, the 
uh, southwest part of, of the UK in the English Channel. Uh, there was a coccolithophore bloom, I think that happened a few weeks ago, it might be still going on. And so we would expect at different phases of the, the year when the ocean color is changing, the community structure will change and this will have implications for higher trophic levels. So this is a motivation of why we really want to know what's going on in terms of the, the ecosystem structure. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about the types of phytoplankton that we might encounter. And I'm gonna focus on our, our four main groups. This is not a comprehensive uh, list of phytoplankton groups, but a subset. So let's start with the diatoms. The diatoms um, are kind of the, the largest of, of the phytoplankton groups. They tend to be over 20 microns, they're microplankton. They have these uh, beautiful uh, silica coats, these, these shells of silica called frustules. They come in two general forms. One are the centrics uh, that have this, this round shape and the pennates that tend to be elongated. The centric diatoms tend to be more planktonic, free floating, and the pennate diatoms tend to be more in benthic communities and under sea ice, although there are some that are also uh, planktonic. So these are the, the two forms of uh, diatoms. They can form longer chains as well, especially the centric ones. And because they're very large and because they have this silica skeleton, they tend to be negatively buoyant. So they tend to sink. So they play a very important role in the biological carbon pump as illustrated here. So the CO2 that they um, take up uh, through the process of photosynthesis and, and primary production was discussed last week, that organic matter, some of it does sink to depths where um, it's sufficiently deep that it's um, basically trapped in the deep ocean. Some of that organic matter will uh, be remineralized and um, nutrients of course, and, and the silicate will be released back into the, the water, and then um, that can be potentially mixed back up to the surface at a later time. But diatoms play a very important role in the biological carbon pump, and that's one of the reasons why we're interested in, in understanding their distribution and their productivity. The other reason is, is because they play a really essential role in the nutritional quality of marine ecosystems as well. They tend to be rich in lipids, in particular in uh, uh, also um, fatty acids, um, the omega-3 fatty acids. And this is really important for um, the overall nutritional quality of uh, polar ecosystems, such as um, regions in the Arctic. So, so here's some uh, uh, under ice diatoms that are feeding this, um, uh, Arctic community. And so if sea ice declines and if diatoms tend to become less abundant, this will have knock-on effects for uh, especially the larger mammals in the ecosystem and also the indigenous communities that rely on these, these animals for food. So this is another motivation behind why we would like to know about the distribution of di diatoms and potentially detect them from satellite. The next group are the haptophytes. These are intermediate in size, so they're nanophytoplankton. They're between two and 20 microns in size. And you can see they have a very uh, diverse range of, of shapes and they can have scales, they can have calcium carbonate plates such as the, the coccolithophore shown here. And um, they tend to be ubiquitous throughout the global ocean. Haptophytes are kind of this, this constant background of cells. They can change in their community structure, but they're always there. We're particularly interested in coccolithophores because they have these, these um, calcium carbonate lists. So um, here's a picture from a scanning electron microscope showing one of these lists. And the interesting thing about coccolithophore blooms, as was shown in one of the previous slides, is that when these 
So we can see these these coccolithophore blooms starting to to increase in their um, distribution in places like the Barents Sea. The interesting thing about coccolithophores is that the the lists actually are produced intracellularly, so inside the cells, and this is a an amazing. Uh, uh, video from Allison Taylor, who is at the Marine Biological Association, showing how these lists are produced inside the coccolithophore and are actually um, released outside of the, uh, it crosses a membrane, basically punches through the, the cell membrane and attaches to the outside of the coccolithophore. So these lists are constantly being produced and sometimes, as I said before, they're shed into the water as individual particles. Why we're interested in, in detecting calcifiers is that they play two roles in the carbon cycle. One is that like all phytoplankton, they take up CO2 through photosynthesis and some of that um, uh, fixed carbon sinks to, to greater depths, and this is also because the, the coccoliths themselves are, are make the, the cells very negatively buoyant. They, they're quite dense. The other reason is that calcification actually results in, in the production of carbon dioxide in the surface ocean. So the, the calcification process can be a source of CO2. So whether these coccolithophores are, are actively uh, calcifying, whether they're sinking or remaining in the, the surface ocean, this will dictate whether the phytoplankton uh, blooms are a source or a sink of, of CO2. Haptophytes are another group. Um, uh, haptophytes, the, the other group I'd like to basically talk about are the phaeocystis. These um, lack calcium carbonate uh, plates, but they have a, a flagella and a haptonema. This allows these, these cells to be motile. They are very important producers of dimethyl sulfide, actually coccolithophores as well. And this is a very important precursor of cloud condensation nuclei. So, the production of phaeocystis and coccolithophores are really important for the formation of clouds. Some of you may have uh, experienced uh, these uh, very intense coccolithophore blooms um, uh, along the seashore. When they uh, bloom offshore, they cause these very foamy um, uh, beaches um, to, to occur. This is due to the polysaccharides that um, are formed in, in, in these colonies, leading to these very frothy beaches. So the reason why we're really interested in detecting coccolithophores and phaeocystis is their um, role in calcification and also in the production of um, these cloud condensation nuclei. So when uh, these haptophytes form clouds, uh, these clouds can reflect some of the sun's um, heat and thus cools the planet. So it plays a, another role in regulating uh, the global climate system. The next group are the dinoflagellates. These um, cells are um, also quite large, like diatoms, they're um, microphytoplankton. They're greater than uh, 20 microns on average. Um, they largely exist in single cells. They don't form chains like uh, diatoms. And uh, so they tend to be uh, as single cells and they tend to swim around with their uh, flagella. So they have two flagella which make them motile, one that is a transverse flagellum that wraps around the cell, and a longitudinal flagellum that kind of acts as a propeller. This allows them to regulate their, um, their position vertically in the water column. During the daytime, they can go into the, the lit layer of the ocean and maybe get, catch a few more photons for their growth. And um, at nighttime, they can take advantage of nutrients that might um, occur deeper in the water column. 
Lastly, I'd like to talk about the cyanobacteria. This is um, another very important group of um, uh, phytoplankton. Cyanobacteria um, occur in, in two different groups. The picocyanobacteria, like Prochlorococcus and Senecococcus, tend to be very tiny, um, between half a micron and a micron in diameter. So they don't tend to sink. Their productivity um, is, is largely constrained to the surface ocean. They, they don't um, participate very strongly in the biological carbon pump. And therefore, they are involved in more of the regenerated production. So most of the CO2 that they take up gets re-released back into the atmosphere. So, so they don't really play a, much of a, an important role in the biological carbon pump, unlike diatoms, which tend to play a, a much more stronger role, as we discussed. The other interesting things about cyanobacteria is that they are nitrogen fixers. Um, so they are able to take up, in addition to carbon dioxide, um, they are able to take up uh, dinitrogen gas and, and incorporate that into organic matter. So they play a very important role in bringing nitrogen into marine ecosystems. The most, um, the most well-known group of nitrogen fixers is Trichodesmium. It's been known since the time of ancient mariners, even um, uh, Darwin in his Voyage of the Beagle discussed Trichodesmium. You can see it with the naked eye, as we discussed before. It's on the order of um, a couple of millimeters in length. So when they uh, bloom, you can actually see them as um, these little um, uh, strands of, of reddish colored um, colonies in, in the surface ocean. Um, we also know um, since they've been able to, to probe a little more deeper into nitrogen fixers through the use of molecular biology, that there are other nitrogen fixers that are quite a bit smaller in the pico to nanoplankton range, and even some that occur within uh, diatoms as endosymbiotes. So in terms of the distribution of trichodesmium, this has been reported quite a bit in the literature. And this is a map that was uh, put together uh, by Julie LaRoche um, showing where they tend to bloom. And we can see that trichodesmium tends to bloom um, in lower latitudes in very warm waters. We see that there's blooms inshore, but also we can see that there's some in the open ocean, in particular in the Atlantic Basin. And this was always a, a bit of a curiosity. And we now know that the reason why we get these, these blooms of trichodesmium in the Atlantic is because of uh, Saharan dust really fertilizing um, these trichodesmium. Trichodesmium as nitrogen fixers have a, a high requirement for iron, and, and this is why we, we tend to see them dominate in this region of the ocean. So again, we really would like to, to understand the distribution of all these different phytoplankton groups because they play such a, a different roles in, in the cycling of carbon and nitrogen in the ocean. So now let's look at how we measure phytoplankton community structure. So there's a number of different ways. Um, one way is by nets, and I think most of us have seen phytoplankton nets or, or zooplankton nets being deployed. Um, and we, this was usually done using silk nets in, in the old days. And um, more recently, there's been um, a device that that's uses a very similar mesh called a continuous plankton recorder. Again, this was um, developed by Sir Alistair Hardy and um, the Sir Alistair Hardy Foundation, based in Plymouth, actually looks at samples collected from this device. So it's quite clever. It, it takes the same mesh that's used in zooplankton nets. It passes it through an opening. Um, so as, as this device is being towed through the water, the phytoplankton and zooplankton stick on this mesh. There's a little propeller that spins around as it's, as it's being um, 
uh, uh, trawled through the water. And that causes this spool to spin. And so as the phytoplankton are being collected continuously, it's being rolled into a little bundle. And so we have a continuous record of the phytoplankton as uh, this device is being trawled through long distances through ocean basins. Um, and this is just a really clever device um, that was developed in the 1920s or so to, to look at phytoplankton community structure and how it's changing across ocean basins continuously. So it's called our continuous plankton recorder. And it's still being deployed today um, at a variety of different stations across the world. But the thing about meshes in terms of these nets and meshes is that a lot of plankton, of course, get through. Uh, these typical mesh sizes are about 100 microns or so. And we saw before that a lot of uh, phytoplankton are, are less than 20 microns in diameter and, and may pass through these, these meshes. So we need to really take into account the smaller phytoplankton. And so typically we collect seawater samples and uh, we do this through a variety of different techniques. We can take a, a bucket, um, the old school way, or we can sample throughout the water column using this device called um, a CTD rosette with a, a range of bottles that can be tripped from the bottom of the photic zone, which can be as deep as 200 meters in the clearest ocean waters up to the sea surface. And then we can collect that seawater sample, preserve the cells, and then look at them under a microscope and see the diversity of cells that might pass through our uh, plankton net or through our continuous plankton recorder. As Bob mentioned last week, we can also harvest these cells onto glass fiber filters. Of course, the glass fiber filter has a mesh size that is far more finer. It's on the order of about 0.4 microns. So this can really trap most of the phytoplankton cells. And of course, we can uh, harvest these cells and look at their various pigments through high performance liquid chromatography analysis. And this is a chromatogram shown here. So the, the phytoplankton pigments are extracted um, from our filter um, and are separated out into a column. And each based on its, its size and charge is, is retained at different times and eluded out. Uh, and we can uh, figure out which phytoplankton pigment is present and at what concentration. And phytoplankton um, pigments, um, well, some of them are found uh, more ubiquitously. Chlorophyll A, of course, is found in all photosynthetic organisms, either in the form of monovinyl or divinyl. Divinyl is a particular marker for Prochlorococcus. Otherwise, we have all these other chlorophylls and carotenoids that are distributed throughout various taxa. You can see that there's a lot of overlap, so we have to be very careful about how we uh, interpret these data. But we can use a variety of different um, techniques of, of grouping together these, these chlorophyll pigments and trying to decipher what the relative abundance of different phytoplankton taxa are, and even maybe infer something about their, their size distribution. So this is kind of a, a general grouping of the major phytoplankton pigments and the basic uh, taxonomic groups that they tend to be associated with and the size classes. But again, uh, a word of warning, and this is uh, probably highlighted in, in certainly the IOCCG report that I will recommend at the end, that you do really have to look at the cells that are in your, your water samples. You have to kind of understand your region and what phytoplankton tend to bloom because there can be um, exceptions to the rule. For example, zeaxanthin, we would tend to associate with picocyanobacteria such as Prochlorococcus and Senecococcus. But as we mentioned before, things like trichodesmium can show up, a trichodesmium bloom, 
And of course, these trichodesium colonies are much larger and also contain very similar pigments. So there is, there is some sort of research that needs to be done before we can use these, um, these pigment markers in a really intelligent and meaningful way. One of the things that mysteries that came up when looking at phytoplankton pigments was that there were these divinyl chlorophylls. And this was a real uh, puzzle in um, the 1980s. They also found that a lot of cells went through these, these smaller filter sizes. Let's say if they, you used a, a, a two micron filter or, or smaller. So we knew that there were these smaller cells and we knew that there were these strange pigments and we didn't know where they came from. And so there was a method that was adopted through the medical field, um, a particular instrument called a flow cytometer. A flow cytometer basically is a cell counter. It, it was used to count human cells, but also uh, biological oceanographers such as Bill Lee and, and, and Trevor Platt, who, who are, are shown in this, this uh, photo here, recognize that you could use these, these counters to look at phytoplankton, especially the very small ones that seem to be very difficult to detect in seawater. And so um, they started to use these in uh, oceanographic research. And we found that the smaller cells were important. And in particular, uh, it was found that there was this um, cyanobacterium called Prochlorococcus that was the culprit that was leading to these divinyl chlorophylls being found in our HPLC samples, our pigment samples, high performance liquid chromatography samples. Um, and so that mystery was solved. And actually, the, the person who identified uh, Prochlorococcus was Penny Chisholm. So she actually isolated these cells and sequenced these cells and identified them as novel, free living. Uh, prokaryotic cells, um, and and so these cyanobacteria we now know are the most abundant and smallest photosynthetic organisms on our planet. Interestingly, uh, Prochlorococcus was first discovered deeper in the water column because they were easier to detect. They have a higher concentration of pigments within them because um, they are low light acclimated. So they have to chuck their, their cells full of um, uh, pigments to, to basically uh, to grow and, and thrive in these, these darker waters. And it was only very um, a, bit, a bit later on where it was discovered that they're actually quite abundant at the surface. They're just very difficult to see. They're quite optically transparent because they have so little divinyl chlorophyll within them. So this is just a, a little picture showing a flow cytometer. It um, passes uh, the cells through a, a very uh, small aperture one by one. And what a flow cytometer does is it shines um, a laser beam on these cells. Um, basically, blue light is, is shone on these cells. If they contain pigments, they will uh, re-emit red light uh, if it has chlorophyll. And also, the, the cells will scatter light, and the scattering signal will tell us something about their size. In addition to the red chlorophyll fluorescence, it can also detect fluorescence from other pigments. For example, there's, there's uh, these biliproteins or phycourethrins that uh, emit um, orange light or orange fluorescence. So here's um, some data from a flow cytometer. This is courtesy of Glenn Turan at the Plymouth Marine Lab showing um, chlorophyll fluorescence, so the red fluorescence signal on the x-axis, on the y-axis, and the side scatter on the x-axis. And we can see that different communities of cells are clustering along um, these uh, various gradients of fluorescence and, and size scatter. And we see we're going from the very smallest uh, cyanobacteria up into the, the larger uh, eukaryotic cells. Um, we can also see that, for example, coccolithophores with their calcite uh, lists are going to scatter much more strongly, so they have a much higher side scatter. 
We can also see um, in the, the inner panel, if we were to look at the, the orange fluorescence, cryptophytes would, would pop up. So the flow cytometer is able to, to group these cells, these different populations of cells together, but it is still quite coarse in its resolution, especially with the larger eukaryotic cells. Apart from cells like coccolithophores or cryptophytes with very unique optical properties in their scattering and, and fluorescent properties, the rest of the phytoplankton, very difficult uh, the, the larger eukaryotic cells to discriminate just based on their chlorophyll fluorescence and scattering alone. Nevertheless, um, for the tinier picocyanobacteria, these, these flow cytometers are, are just a marvel that we're able to now enumerate them very quickly and efficiently. And in particular, we've understood a lot more about Prochlorococcus through the use of flow cytometry. And also, flow cytometry has also allowed us to, to isolate these cells and sequence their genomes, and so we know much more about their diversity. And so, here's some interesting facts about Prochlorococcus I thought I would share with you, because this is just an amazing um, little um, bug. Um, it has 80,000 genes that are associated with the various strains. And this is four times the total of the human genome. So within this federation of cells, within these all these different strains of Prochlorococcus, there's this rich amount of, of diversity in terms of genes. And, and that means that they, they are functionally quite diverse as well. In terms of their biomass, it's again huge. Um, this interesting uh, uh, paper. Um, converted it into Volkswagen beetles, so another type of bug. And um, if we're to convert chlorococcus biomass into uh, Volkswagen beetles, it will be 220 million Volkswagen beetles to be equal to the uh, mass of prochlorococcus in the world oceans. And in terms of the number of cells per milliliter in um, the oligotrophic oceans where they flourish, we can get up to or exceeding 100,000 uh, cells per milliliter. As I mentioned before, Prochlorococcus is, is really successful. It can occupy the surface ocean and that actually can be uh, uh, most abundant at the surface, although very difficult to detect by flow cytometry. These highlight um, cells are actually different strains of Prochlorococcus. They're really specialized in terms of their, their genes, in terms of their genetic makeup that allow them to thrive in these very high light conditions that are very um, extreme and, and punishing. Uh, they, they experience high amounts of photo damage. They're in very low uh, nutrient conditions. So, um, we have particular groups of Prochlorococcus ecotypes that thrive in these conditions. And then at the other extreme, deeper in the water column, we have, again, quite high populations of Prochlorococcus. But these strains um, are specialized to um, thrive in low light conditions. So in um, these conditions, they, they might be able to specialize in using different forms of nutrients that are made available um, deeper in the water column. So nitrite, for example, is, is a form of, of nitrogen that it can readily use, and even some forms of nitrate they, they have been shown to, to utilize. So these are really um, uh, quite a diverse uh, assemblage, and, and, and that is kind of illustrated in the, in the previous slide, that there's all these uh, genes that these different Prochlorococcus ecotypes have to occupy these vastly different um, niches in, in the open ocean. So lastly, I'd like to talk a little bit about the optical properties of uh, the phytoplankton and, and whether we can really detect these different groups. I mean, this is, this is the overall challenge is to try and see if we can uh, discriminate between different phytoplankton. Um, and, and find out whether they, they occupy particular regions of the ocean 
whether, and that will tell us something about the fate of carbon, for example, or whether we have nitrogen fixers. So we can see here, um, these are the absorption spectra of the various pigments that are found in phytoplankton. So the chlorophylls are shown in black here, and we can see they absorb in the blue and in the red. We have uh, the carotenoids, um, the photosynthetic ones absorb in, in this kind of green to blue-green region of the spectrum, and then the photoprotective uh, carotenoids tend to absorb more in the blue. So we can see that there's these subtle changes in these, these pigments, and the, the question is, can we really um, say something about community structure by knowing something about the uh, absorptive properties of these phytoplankton. So let's look at the uh, absorptive characteristics of these phytoplankton populations in the field and see if we can see differences. So here we're looking at the absorption efficiency of the phytoplankton. So the uh, absorption of phytoplankton cells normalized to the chlorophyll A concentration. So this gives you an absorption efficiency. We can see that Prochlorococcus tends to have the highest absorption efficiency. This makes sense. They're the smallest phytoplankton. They also have very high absorption efficiency because they have a lot of these photoprotective pigments within them, uh, especially these highlight acclimated Prochlorococcus. And as we go to larger and larger cells, we see that there's this, this drop in the absorption efficiency and a flattening of the absorption spectra. This is due to the so-called package effect. Um, briefly, the package effect is, is the, um, the fact that the, the phytoplankton, when they um, are, the pigments are, are packaged within smaller cells versus in one large cell, um, if, if this happens and we, we shine, a, let's say, a light source on, on these, these smaller particles, they will likely intercept the incident photons. So they'll have a much higher absorption efficiency than if it's contained in one large cell uh, within that light field. And similarly, the same thing happens with uh, looking at intracellular pigment concentration. The more cells that are packaged within that phytoplankton cells then the more, the less efficient those, those pigments will absorb light because the cells on the outside, the circumference of the cell will absorb those photons, which means that the, 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 the pigments in the core will not be able to absorb it due to this self-shading effect. So this is the two, re, the two factors that really regulate this, this packaging or flattening or changing in the absorption efficiency, the overall size of the cells and also its intracellular pigment concentration. So um, I'm uh, realizing that we're, we're running a little short of time, but I just wanna show you some examples of phytoplankton absorption spectra in different regions of the ocean. So we saw the dramatic change in, in the global ocean where we were going from Prochlorococcus, which are in kind of the more oligotrophic ocean to, to diatom dominated regions, in, in the, let's say, a coastal upwelling zone. Um, here's some examples of some absorption spectra from the Arctic. And this is work that was done by a student of mine, uh, Andrew Orkney. And we can see um, different groups of phytoplankton cells here, uh, nanoflagellates in, in the blue. We have um, uh, diatoms in, in the green, the, the larger cells. And I can't see this, <laughs> the plot. I, I think um, the, the dinoflagellates are, are the purple and in the red is phaeocystis. And so we can see these, these changes in the um, absorption characteristics or the absorption properties within these different populations as we go from smaller to larger cells. Even in these high Arctic conditions, where we're having not really Prochlorococcus and these highlight acclimated picocyanobacteria, but largely mostly eukaryotic cells that are, are um, acclimated to, to lower light conditions. So even in these regions, we can see differences in their absorption properties. 
And um, we basically use these absorption spectra to develop algorithms to detect these different groups um, of phytoplankton cells. And for example, we developed an algorithm to detect them in the Barents Sea. Um, so the green um, shows uh, where we anticipate finding diatoms based on um, this, this algorithm using these various uh, absorption spectra and where we expect to find uh, dinoflagellates and flagellates. Um, again, the reason why we're interested in is, is to know something about um, the marine food web in, in the Arctic. It plays a very important role in the nutritional quality, as we mentioned before, and also the supply of nutrition to the benthos as well, because the diatoms tend to sink um, more readily and, and reach the benthic communities that rely on phytoplankton for food. Another interesting thing in the Arctic is that we do get different phytoplankton cells that are either in, in, in the ice or in, in snow, and this changes the albedo of ice. So there's a large um, uh, interest in uh, detecting different phytoplankton that are within and on top of the ice because it, it can affect uh, the ice melt. Um, and this is a, a, a very nice paper that um, looks at the, the presence of a photosynthetic ciliate called Mesodinium rubrum that makes these um, uh, ice packs uh, pink or red in color. So we can get even red tides in um, sea ice. And here's a absorption spectrum of mesodinium rubrum that we um, actually measured uh, off the coast of, of Canada. Again, showing this, this uh, very large uh, absorption by um, phycourethrin uh, these pigments that are found in cryptophytes, actually, uh, in these ciliates, uh, the cryptophytes are, are harbored within them, they're, they're pigments, and that's what gives them their, their reddish color. So we can see that Mesodinium rubrum is quite optically distinct from these other groups of phytoplankton that we've, we measured in the Arctic, and can be a, a useful way in which we might be able to detect these, these red tides within sea ice. So I think I should uh, probably wrap things up um, by talking about future opportunities. Um, I hope that this, this lecture, I know it, it went a bit quicker than I had hoped, um, kind of highlights the, the rich diversity of phytoplankton in the ocean. And in the old days, it was largely thought that whatever went through a, a, a phytoplankton net um, was really not important. They were small, kind of boring cells and that all the, the you know, interesting stuff happened in the shelf. They, they were these large, exotic uh, dinoflagellates and diatoms, and that, you know, that they were very important in, in the global biogeochemical cycle, and they are. But I, I hope that I've driven home the point that there is this other community of cells that are very important, the nanoflagellates and the picophytoplankton that um, dominate in, in the global ocean and, again, play a very important role in things like nitrogen fixation, calcification, and that we really need to understand their distribution in the global ocean. And we are entering into a really exciting time in biological oceanography. There are new tools now to look at phytoplankton diversity in a way that we were never able to do this before. So there's these, these new missions called Terra Oceans and uh, an international uh, initiative called uh, Biogeoscates that is going to try to develop a deeper understanding of the real composition, detailed composition of these microbial communities of the plankton and to really get a deep understanding of their role in biogeochemical cycles. And it's by looking at their omics, their, their, their DNA, and their RNA. So the DNA tells us about who's out there in terms of um, sequencing and, and figuring out um, uh, what species are out there. But the RNA, this tells us what genes are being expressed. And so this really gets to the, the core of of what proteins are being produced, what biogeochemical pathways are 
being um, uh, are important in those particular regions. So this is really an important tool. And so these new missions, they're going to be surveying uh, plankton community structure using nets, using in situ pumps, using CTD casts, collecting water samples, uh, producing a whole range of uh, data sets on their uh, genetic uh, diversity, and also their morphology and their um, um, size diversity as well, getting at the size structure. There's new optical instruments that can um, detect the, the various shapes and sizes of the plankton communities. So we're getting all this rich information that hopefully can be linked back to the satellite, to these optical water types that uh, Sir Alistair Hardy was talking about. Sir Alistair Hardy was talking about using these, these different colors of the ocean to maybe glean information on the types of fish populations that are being supported. And now we might be able to use these, these uh, optical uh, water types to tell us something about the communities of plankton that are playing such a vital role in ocean biogeochemical cycles and supporting mm -hmm. these fisheries and, and marine mammals that um, uh, we would like to protect and conserve. So these information from satellites and floats on the optical properties of seawater hopefully will help us put marine microbes on the map and provide some new views of some old oceans. So I'd just like to conclude with that and uh, thank you very much for your attention and sorry about the technical difficulties. In terms of resources, I'd just like to uh, highlight a few of the uh, IOCCG reports. I think they've been highlighted in some of the other um, uh, talks, but there's one on phytoplankton functional types, there's one on um, linking uh, ocean color to biogeochemical and ecosystem models, and one on harmful algal blooms and ocean color radiometry. And I also put the link to Terra Oceans because it is an amazing data set um, worth exploring. And uh, again, um, they're collecting all the optical data alongside with this and pigment data, and I'm sure there's going to be some really exciting and interesting ways of linking satellites with this wonderful uh, global data set. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heather. I think that was, uh, as you said, there was a lot to cover there. <laughs> There's a lot of material. Um, so thank you for the summary. And again, sorry to everyone for the uh, slight technical hitch at the start. Um, Today's my machine was far too warm. Um, great. So we had um, a whole bunch of uh, questions have come into the chat. Please, by all means, put more questions in the chat as we go through the, the Q and A session. Um, we will try to answer as much as we can. Um, and as usual, uh, it's not all on Heather. Uh, the whole all the panelists can can chip in uh, if they want to. Um, but uh, will lead with uh, with the questions obviously to to Heather. So um quick usual technical points and um, there was a few questions around uh, and points people saying they couldn't see a couple of the slides or things. So if you had any of your own personal technical issues throughout um, the videos will be up on YouTube. I think there's been a link posted in the chat uh, to that YouTube channel you can subscribe to um so the video will be available uh, within a few days normally. Um Okay, so on to the science questions. Um, a quick one. So, well, I don't know how quick this will be. Um, you mentioned obviously there's a a huge range in both the size and physical characteristics of the phytoplankton. Um, so, and some of them are better sampled, say uh, uh, through filtering onto a net. Some of them we have to go to uh, flow cytometry. Some of them we have to use maybe pigments. Um, I was just wondering if there's one that you would say is particularly tricky to to sample because it doesn't really fit well into any of those uh, fields. Yeah, well, I can tell you one that's a real pain. 
and um, you you might have uh, uh, come across this yourself, TJ, is phaocystis. Phaocystis is a mess because it forms these globulous colonies of polysaccharides, and um, so and yet they're made of tiny cells. And so when you sample it on a filter, the optical characteristics, I, I would say, are, are quite probably different than what it would be in suspension. And I think this is true of a lot of the, the more kind of colonial type of um, phytoplankton is, is that the optical properties tend to get um, uh, more difficult when if you use a conventional filter. Um, also, the fact of sampling them is is difficult because they form these colonies. They can be abundant but very patchy. So you trip a Niskin bottle, and you might get a colony or a few colonies in one Niskin bottle, and not in another. And so this, this causes a lot of issues. So a, a lot of people filter um, actually sample phaeocystis from nets, knowing that the colonies are going to be all mashed together. But at least the biomass is going to be um, accounted for, and that you can um, get at the, the volume going through the net and, and try and get a, a reliable biomass estimate. Because I think a lot of the things with, with phaeocystis and some of these other colonial um, phytoplankton, even, even things like trichodesmium, is it, that they can be patchy. And to get a real reliable estimate of the biomass becomes very tricky. And again, uh, trichodesmium, you, you get a lot in nets, and actually nets are quite an efficient way of, of capturing trichodesmium. Uh, okay. Um, there was a question around um, your opinion on using uh, chlorophyll A, phycocyanin, or a mixture of both for assessing cyanobacteria from satellites. So it's kind of, I, I guess it's the, the feasibility of, of that identification. Do you have any opinion? Well, the problem with the Billy proteins, and I know there's some people on the call, i.e. Vivian, <laughs> who are much more experienced at uh, talking about phycobillins. And the, the problem with those pigments is that they're water soluble, so we don't tend to detect them through routine HPLC analysis. So, in order for us to develop algorithms, we're really not in a very good position because it's not routinely um, sampled by HPLC. So, okay. um, in terms of detecting uh, cyanobacteria from satellite, um, empirical algorithms are often used, and it probably will have to do a lot with the pigment packaging and the fact of having a lot of these um, photoprotective pigments causing this real um, uh, high uh, specific absorption coefficient. That's a signal that I think can really uh, discriminate um, picocyanobacteria from other cells. They, they really have a very high specific absorption coefficient. Okay. Um... There was a question on um, the, so this is relating to, I guess, nutrients. Um, to, uh, to what extent does the low availability of nutrient control, nutrients control the rate of enzymatic reactions, the productivity of the oceans, and the biogeochemical cycles of elements such as carbon and nitrogen? So I guess this is uh, talking about, I guess, more micronutrients, right, controlling those macronutrients. So I guess you can go into and I'll see and all those sorts of things. Um, so uh, that's quite a, a lengthy question. It's quite a, it's quite a broad, <laughs> yeah, it's quite a broad question, um, I'm afraid. So, <laughs> so definitely, I, I couldn't get into nutrient cycling because that's a completely, you know, um, a couple of lectures in and of themselves. Um, HNLC regions um, are. Uh, quite important in determining community structure and productivity. Um, as soon as uh, phytoplankton become limited by iron, they are really compromised in terms of their growth. And in particular, eukaryotic cells such as diatoms, the handbrake tends to go on very strong. So, so they, they, 
they tend to be quite vulnerable um, to iron limitation. As I mentioned before, trichodesmium, another one that has a high iron quota that if iron isn't present, they will struggle. So it affects their, certainly their, um, their enzymatic activity, in particular, the photosystems have an iron requirement, so it's going to affect the photosynthesis. It's going to affect nitrogen fixation. So it will uh, impact um, these, these phytoplankton in terms of their, their growth. And, um, and some other um, phytoplankton um, may uh, not necessarily thrive, but might um, start to dominate. For example, haptophytes tend to do somewhat better under iron limitation than, than diatoms. So we tend to see this, this change um, as soon as iron becomes limited from a diatom-dominated system to, to a more uh, haptophyte-dominated system. And, um, yeah, it tends to be um, haptophytes that are actually uh, kind of nanoflagellates, not necessarily coccolithophores. So I don't know if that answers the question, but yes, um, nutrients play a, a dramatic role in productivity um, and because they affect different communities differently, um, it affects community structure as well. And the two go very hand in hand in terms so of their nutrient say? requirements. And there is a wonderful uh, review paper by Mark Moore um, in Nature Geosciences. If you want to look at nutrient cold limitation, I highly recommend reading it. So, so when you were saying about the iron being um, particularly uh, inhibiting the, the photo machinery for diatoms and, and others. Is it that those that aren't so limited by iron have a different, uh, you know, building blocks for their uh, photosystems, or is it that they substitute things in? Or, I mean, how? I, I'm not sure if we exactly know um, why haptophytes are better okay. than diatoms. Um, it probably has something to do with their photosystems. It has something to do potentially with photo damage as well and repair mechanisms. Okay. We really, yeah, I, I, I'm not an expert on that, I'm afraid. Okay. That's fine. Um, okay, so next question. Um, there, was, there was one about, uh, so someone was particularly interested in your uh, ice red tides and they were wondering which satellite you might use to look uh, at that, because it's it's almost a terrestrial problem, uh, not the kind of classic ocean color. That is um, not my area. You might know better than me today, <laughs> but that's what I'd like to use to monitor these these ice tides. Yeah, I mean, uh, Lauren's also probably a good good person to to talk to to this sort of thing. I mean, it depends. I, how big are these? I mean, if it's, you know, the Sentinel-2 is good for small resolution stuff, like you might see on the surface of the ice, but if you get a big one, then then Sentinel-3 is going to have a higher spectral um, capabilities. So it, it really depends on their spatial scale. Um, and it, I mean, the pink is quite distinct, so I feel like that you wouldn't need such a good spectral resolution. You might be able to get away with Sentinel-2. Yeah, and I think they are quite small. Okay. They, they, so, tend yeah. to, they tend to, I think they form when the, the leads start start to close, they might get trapped in there okay. when it refreezes. So, so uh, I guess if someone's interested in going looking for that, maybe try Sentinel-2. So then all you're left with is cloud and, you know, the high latitudes are just the cloudiest regions on Earth. So what's the problem be? <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. You just have to distinguish your white clouds from your white ice. It's fine. Yeah, absolutely. No problem. <laughs> Whoever gets that right, please let us know. We'd love to know. Um, so there was a there was also a question. Um, it's it says it's a general question uh, regarding the integration and assimilation of ocean color satellites with biogeochemical models such as Pisces or CR Pisces CR OCO. Um, I don't know if that's one you you know or are familiar with, but. Um, they, the person is asking for any insights on that that data assimilation, I guess, um, step. Now, I know that's obviously not your expertise, Heather, but um, I know there's been data assimilation of chlorophyll uh, as a satellite data field into models um, where they're trying to basically at each step of the model, a uh, time step, uh, or where the time step aligns with the sampling interval of the satellite, 
you're recorrecting your model back to the truth of the satellite, uh, which is kind of the premise of the data assimilation, allowing for uncertainties in both the model and, and the satellite. You're trying to get back to uh, the measured values. Um, whether that's been done extensively with more of the phytoplankton groups, um, Bob's got his hand up, so I'm going to let him go on that one. Uh, yeah, I thought I'd jump in on that um, a little one. Um, so I'm not so familiar with PCs, but certainly uh, um, we did some work back in 2018 at, at Plymouth Marine Laboratory. Uh, Stefano Chiavata was leading the work at the time on um, the assimilation of phytoplankton functional type chlorophyll into ursum. So that's a slightly different biogeochemical model with four uh, phytoplankton functional types. Um, so we did a uh, um, couple of things we had to sort of do is firstly align the phytoplankton functional types that we can monitor or map from space with the same functional types that are in the model, right? Um, and so there were four model uh, functional groups in ursum, uh, diatoms, dinoflagellates, pico and nano plank uh, plankton. I think in PCs there are two. Uh, so you've got diatoms and nanoplankton. Uh, in PCs. Uh, so that's important to do. Um, uh, and then basically the simulations that uh, Stefano uh, or the work he was leading uh, gave some pretty strong evidence that we can improve the performance of the uh, data assimilation by assimilating phytoplankton type specific chlorophyll rather than total chlorophyll. So, which was quite a a good thing from from our satellite point of view because it demonstrated that some of the products that we were producing had added value um, uh, over just total chlorophyll. Um, one of the the things that they often need with the data assimilation is uncertainties in the data. So, we also did quite a lot of work uh, trying to map uh, robust per pixel uncertainties in these phytoplankton functional groups, and sort of as Heather alluded to a little bit in her talk, some of them are a bit more easier to infer or detect than others. So it's really important to put realistic uncertainties in your satellite products when you're performing these data assimilation techniques. Uh, one other thing just to add, um, uh, and there is a lot of work certainly, I know they've been doing that, this over in the US at MIT within the Darwin model, but also uh, again within Urson. Um, another way to assimilate ocean color data is rather than trying to assimilate the PFT products, you can actually incorporate an ocean color model within your biogeochemical uh, model. Um, so ultimately, your biogeochemical model can produce remote sensing reflectance, which is the same thing that the satellite detects directly. And then you can assimilate the ocean color data that way. And that's shown uh, some advantage, certainly in more optically complex waters where um, the op ocean color signal is not dominated by um, uh, or controlled by the phytoplankton, but also by other uh, non-algal particles and substances in the water. Yeah, and there's a whole um, uh, IOCCG report that actually talks about this, um, and it's led by, um, I think, uh, Steph um, is one of the, the lead authors from MIT who, who does that type of assimilation. Um, so then there's a, there's a couple of questions which I guess um, are more on the kind of earth science uh, side of things. Which uh, one one was about um, if changing temperatures in high latitudes um, will lead to some phytoplankton groups becoming maybe extinct if they're adapted to uh, the cold temperatures and and uh, or you know and we probably have seen things like this in the in the geological record in the past. But um, you know, do you think that there will be groups that disappear uh, as other groups you know move in to fill uh, the the space that they're more adapted to? Um, and there was another question on um, if the oligotrophic regions expand, which has been um, proposed by some uh, some research uh, as a as a possible future um, scenario. Uh, what are the implications for for global primary productivity? So, uh, I guess from your from your viewpoint, uh, what do you think the the changes that we uh, with with the coming change might be in those communities? Um. Yeah, so let, let's start with the first one first. Um, so the Arctic, um, our, our polar polar science uh, question about community structure changes. Definitely um, one of the, the primary concerns is, is a loss of sea ice algae, as I mentioned before. 
Um, they play a very important role in benthic pelagic coupling. So um, they, they feed the, the benthic uh, food, food web. Um, and they're also, again, quite nutritionally important. And, you know, they, they will disappear. Um, and uh, as, as sea ice starts to recede, um, you know, there, there will be sea ice certain times of the year. It's just the seasonality and the distribution will change. And I think that's going to happen with a lot of phytoplankton populations with warming is that you're, you're going to see a migration of uh, communities, um, perhaps uh, poleward, so the temperate ones might come. Um, further north, we see that with, for example, Ameliana huxleyi blooms. Um, they tend to be uh, migrating further north um, uh, as Atlantic water. Well, it also has to do with the circulation of, uh, of changes in ocean circulation as well, and, and the polar uh, gyres, subpolar gyres. But th that is going to be a um, um, a potential change. So we're going to see more temperate uh, phytoplankton. Um, occurring further north, and again, this, the, the change in ice cover is definitely going to change uh, the availability of things like ice algae for um, uh, the, the Arctic communities um, that rely on them for food. So that, that's real um, concern, and, and those changes are happening very rapidly. Um, in terms of the overall uh, Expansion of the the gyres, um, it's it's probably going to affect primary production. I think, um, you know, because the gyres tend to be lower in chlorophyll and also tend to be occupied by by smaller cells. That's going to have implications both for total primary production and, and likely for for new and export production as well. Um, so. There will be there will be those those changes um, as as the gyres do expand. Of course, um, we have to still uh, I think do do some very careful accounting of of primary productivity. We still have a lot to learn. Um, there is um, the satellite sees the surface, and that's what we tend to. To think about when we see the, the expansion of the gyres, but there is subsurface populations that also contribute to primary production. So we have to look at things in the round and, and we're with biogeochemical Argo and other programs, we're able to observe this a bit better. So I, I think going forward, I mean, you, you would kind of think that the, the overall primary productivity will, will decrease if, if the gyres indeed are expanding, but I think, um, we do need to to account for how subsurface populations are also changing. Um, okay, uh, we have a we have a question from uh, I believe someone uh, we know, Priscilla uh, Lange, uh, about um, uh, dust, um, and they've asked other than well actually it's about iron. Other than dust, what are the major sources of iron to the open ocean? Um, because apparently there was a massive Trichodesmian bloom in the South Atlantic last summer. Um, and they're not sure why it happened, and perhaps <laughs> an iron input source would be the explanation. Yeah, so so um, there's been a lot of work on sources and sinks of, of iron and other trace metals as well. Um, manganese is starting to become a, an important um, uh, trace metal as well in, in, in Southern Ocean uh, ecosystems. Um, I, I think a lot of um, Work is now being done on hydrothermal vents, and um, in, in particular, uh, uh, I think so, some groups from um, from Laval and um, uh, Kevin and Rigo's group, I think, were, were looking at this as a, a potential uh, source of, of iron, um, and is something that we we see, for example, when when we were out on on a Southern Ocean cruise that you do get these kind of uh, plumes of iron coming off of um, these these active regions, uh, active vent regions. So, and and where those those little pools of of iron in the deep ocean eventually surface, uh, it's it's a very tricky thing. They they try and do these 
very sophisticated models to try and see where the fate of that that iron that's released by hydrothermal vent. And of course it gets mixed and diluted as it goes along. Um, but that's one source that um, I think people are starting to realize is, is becoming more important. Well, hopefully that's helped uh, Priscilla. <laughs> Just to sort of add as well, fires I think are becoming quite popular, aren't they? They're all Tom well, Newman, yeah. I don't, I don't know if popular is the right word, um, but <laughs> they're, they're becoming, uh, I mean, fires are becoming, they're very, uh, they're on the news a lot recently because there's been some very large ones yeah. and they're becoming more of a problem. Uh, we're definitely seeing a drying uh, in a number of forested areas. Yeah, there's been a lot um, of uh, fires this, this year for sure in North America. Um, and there was, yeah, there's been some work linking um, fire deposition to, to phytoplankton blooms in the Southern Ocean uh, or in that, that belt uh, above the polar front. So, um, yeah, that's that's also definitely. I mean, that's that's. I guess just a variant on dust. It's a, a different form of <laughs> dust coming from. And the same with volcanic ash. If you get a yeah. uh, <laughs> eruption, that's another source. Um, um, but it's. I think it is important to stress the difference between those uh, input sources in terms of uh, how readily the elements actually make it into the water. Um, so there's a there's very different leaching rates out of um, you know volcanic ash versus um, Saharan dust versus uh, forest fire ash. You know they they mm -hmm. they have a different history uh, and they have different physical properties when they touch the water. And also the the fact that there might be other trace metals coming off them as well is mm. is something that we're starting to realize is is important. And even glacial flour is another one that. Um, uh, we're, we're starting to realize too that different sources of that um, have different um, potential fertilization um, uh, well their, their fertilization potential can be quite different yeah um, there was a question from someone who apparently needs an easy method I'm not sure there is one that exists uh, to use flow cytometry to calculate uh, phytoplankton uh, is, is kind of a broad question. I'm guessing we would direct people to uh, uh, people or publications and, and work from people like uh, well Bill Lee, but then also uh, Glenn Turan and others uh, who have done a lot of, of work on how to convert flow cytometry data. Um, I mean, getting flow cytometry data is not not easy. Um, you know, it's a, quite a machine that takes some setting up and expertise to run. Um, but once you have the data, uh, then I think the methods are, I'm not going to say well established, like fixed forever, but there's some well established methodologies uh, that they could, you could um, look up for that. I don't know if you want to add any more to that, Heather. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I, it, it, it is um, a bit of an art. Um, and, and folks like uh, Glenn Turan are, are masters at that. Um, but you, you will start to see there's this really, um, tight clustering of, of cells and, and then it's a question of of uh, basically uh, yeah counting counting those clusters um, based on their scattering and, and fluorescent properties. But um, yeah it's uh, there there is no easy method. It's it's a lot of <laughs> um, hard one data. Um, but it, it's an amazing uh, instrument um, and and really effective at counting small cells mm. quickly. Now, while we're on the topic of fluorescence, um, there was a question about um, less conventional derived products such as fluorescence line height um, and determining the differences in functional types or community structure or stress or physiological state. Um, so I, I guess the question is, um, have you, you know, used fluorescence line height. Uh, what's your opinion on trying to use fluorescence line height? Would you like a better fluorescence line height product? Because it it could be useful if we can do it better. I mean, uh... yeah. So so Tom Browning, um, who who worked in our group at uh, at Oxford, um, used fluorescent line height to look at iron stress and and the quantum yield of fluorescence, um, and uh, it worked. It was modus, and it, it worked quite well. It, it produced um, quantum yields um, maps that um, basically tended to track the HNLC regions. I think um, it is a very, fluorescence is a very difficult beast uh, for, for 
people like Vivian in, in the audience and others who who've thought a lot about fluorescence and uh, as you say it's 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 influenced by taxonomic structure as well as um, uh, the photophysiology of the cells so very physiological so iron iron stress for example affects the, the quantum yield and also photochemical quenching and correcting that is very very important <laughs> to get something useful out of that signal. So uh, I, I would suggest reading a lot of the papers on on kind of trying to to unpick all of these different uh, factors that govern um, solar induced fluorescence. And and there's some there's a really nice uh, textbook um, that was produced by um, uh, well a series of papers by David Suggett. Um, as one of the lead authors, um, some chapters in there that that go through all the the sources of variability of fluorescence, and looks particularly at interpreting things like fluorescence line height. All right, um, getting towards the end of the questions now, which is I think good because you you've got a time constraint, right? We have to finish a little bit early today. Um, so that's a couple of questions. Um, and so there's one. Uh, we've kind of covered this a little bit with the um, uh, long-term change and expansion of the, 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 the gyres question, but um, it cites there's been some uh, links put in the chat uh, to a recent NASA paper. Um, that found an increase in um, phytoplankton blooms, I think in coastal regions particularly, um, from 2003 to 2020. And um, the, the attendee asks if you think that the oceans are becoming more autotrophic or heterotrophic. Um, yeah, well, I know Gavin's spent some time looking at these sorts of things, the autotrophic versus heterotrophic. Um, I, yeah, um, I yeah, mean, that, that's we, a loaded that, question. <laughs> okay, okay. All right. So we don't have a clear answer on that one. <laughs> um, that's fine. I, I would say, yeah, um, in coastal settings, it's, it's really difficult to kind of look at. Uh, trophic status, and especially when you get mixotrophs in the mix, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, it starts to become very, very difficult. I think that that's kind of a new frontier too, is to kind of look at mixotrophy and how much mixotrophy actually occurs. There's a lot of chlorophyll that's in mixotrophs, and you know, trying to do that accounting is complex. Mm -hmm. And that's, I guess that comes down to the question of not just um, whether there are more or less blooms, but what is blooming. It yes. really comes down to the community structures, which is is the detail that yeah, you know you've been trying to uh, to get across. That that's very complicated. Um, very good. Okay, um, I think we're about there on the questions then. Um, so let me bring this to a close there. Um, if there's any others, there's a few few last ones coming in about the prospect of phytoplankton in blue carbon for climate change mitigation. Ooh, um, yes, geoengineering. I don't know if we want to get into that. Um, that's <laughs> um, um, yeah, I, I don't. There's certainly people who propose it. Um, I, I think the idea of iron fertilization is is kind of on its way. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I think lar large scale perturbation of, of ecosystems is probably not the way to go. Um, mm. maybe through bioreactors or other things, 1 can do something, but, um, I think in terms of. Large scale, uh, iron fertilization, I think, um, that, that. That has been, um, basically, uh, uh. Scaled down quite a bit in terms of the that as a, a geoengineering um, uh, scheme. Yeah, I, I guess it's you know we know that there are uh, things we can do in the lab that will increase and, and decrease production or change the the group that uh, is productive into one that maybe has a higher export. But um, going around 
uh, trying to force huge changes into a complex system out of the lab and also not knowing necessarily the fate of that carbon, for example, that you have, you know, how long it's exported for into what waters. And as you, as you said, with the Arctic sea ice, you know, it's about the coupling there between the surface and the benthic realms. And, you know, if you start changing those, then you have all sorts of potential knock on effects. So, yeah, yeah, so it's, um, there's a whole symposium that was all about the unintended consequences of iron fertilization. I think it's still posted somewhere on the Woods Hole website. It's really entertaining to listen to. Okay. You okay. get uh, folks like John Cullen talking about it. It's uh, priceless. Okay, well worth well worth a look. Um, so yeah, I think with that, I will I will offer my thanks for your uh, fascinating lecture uh, and uh, an interesting Q and A session. Um, I'm sure everyone else will will echo that. Thanks. Um, and uh, and we'll call it there. Thank you, attendees. Um, we will see you again next week uh, for a lecture from. Uh, uh, Dionysus um, um, should be very interesting. All right, thanks all. Thank you.